All right, welcome back to another uh, episode of Mad Hat Mondays. Today's guest is Francisco Jarvis, a key figure in youth football in the Virgin Islands, who focuses on getting players in the territory to the next level. Could you tell us a little about a little bit about the guys that are making the jump from high school to the stateside college football? Yeah, sure. So um, the showcase football showcase started back in two thousand eight. And uh, basically, it was a platform for our local players to showcase their skills to uh, mainland colleges. Now, um, I don't know if everybody knows, but unlike on, on the mainland, our football players start football in the ninth grade. Whereas on the mainland, they can start as young as uh, maybe fifth grade or elementary level. There's Pop Warner football on the mainland. There's none here. So our even though our players have been at a, at a disadvantage as far as how long they've been playing, we've still been able to uh, harness a whole bunch of raw, great talent and been able to, uh, who have been able to move on to the next level. You know, so kudos to them. Um, tell us a little bit about this senior class um, that, of the players that are going to make the jump to the next level and um, what impact that they make on the game. You mean this, but this just passed senior class? The, the, the seniors that um, I know, um, Rakai Creaky, he's going to Edward Waters with uh, Kashan Mason as well. Just those, yes. that, that senior class and um, some of the other guys that are making the jump. Um, as far as making the jump, those guys uh, have been ready uh, probably from their junior year as far as raw athletic talent is, is concerned. Um, we continue to be at a disadvantage uh, as far as facilities, as far as number of games being played. Um, however, we still manage to uh, have great games, have great competition, have great coaching, and those guys are blessed enough to make that jump. So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that will continue to happen. Uh, Jarvis. I don't know if I answered the question, but I hope I did. Tell me, I, I think you answered the question, but I, I want to ask you about some of the previous people who went from here to the college. How, how did they do in their first year and, 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 and beyond? We've had a, a lot of great success stories. Um, number one being Celestino White. Celestino White went from junior college, Central Lakes in Minnesota, and he was one of the few ones that were actually um, able to make that jump to a division uh, one, I think. And while he was there at Presentation University, he achieved All-American status his senior year. Matter of fact, he was leading the nation in sacks at one time. Um, people like Carson Wessinger from St. John, was up there in quarterback stats, stats his first year at Central Lakes. Um, Shaquille Peterson has done great at Central Lakes. Uh, so we, we've had a number of them who've, uh, done, who have done really, really well and have gone on. Lon Garfield is another great example of uh, our talent that have been able to go on to, the, to Division two, Division one status. So our players, once we're given the opportunity and the chance, we, we, we can achieve success. Um, with those players, when they make that tr transition to the States, what are some things that they bring up about just the differences between uh, St. Thomas, and the, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John, and the States, either on the field or off the field? I think the, the major difference is uh, – just how much more intense it is. You know, um, we have a lot of coaches in the Virgin Islands who have been doing great jobs over the years. And at the same time, we've had a lot of great help to along the coaching ranks, you know. Um, not everybody uh, is all the time a great coach. It's hard to, to kind of get across sorting lessons and stuff if you've never played the game. So I think the, uh, the level of coaching, the quality of coaching also has been the main difference. I think the number of games they play 
in the States versus here has been, is, is always a big difference, you know? But um, like I said, we've been able to, um, to persevere and do well, despite all those shortcomings. Uh, with, with, with the shortcomings that you're talking about, what, what, what is the process of, of getting a athlete recruited? Even though we don't have a lot of games or we don't have the competition, how are you able to get all these athletes recruited to the state psychologist? Wow. Well, first of all, that wouldn't have been possible without the help of all the coaches. You know, the coaches are year in, year out, take their athletes on the field and able to coach them the best way they can. And by the time the showcase uh, rolls around in March, you know, you're pretty much able to see whether a player can go to the next level or not, you know. So um, I, I would say my hat goes off to, like I say, those coaches over the year who have stuck with the respective programs and have made sure that their athletes um, do get whatever instruction they can get, whatever training they can get, and they're able to move on to the next level. I have a, a particular question about this year's showcase. I know that um, there was a bigger presence of St. Corey schools than there usually is in the showcase. What does it mean to you to like bring both islands together during the showcase um, and create opportunities for both islands, not just one? I didn't hear the first part of your question, Kai. Can you repeat, please? I know in this year's showcase, there was a bigger showing of St. Corey players than usual. So I was just saying, like, what does it mean to bring back, bring the whole of Virgin Islands to the showcase instead of just one island? Yeah, well, that, that was all brought about really by the Department of Education Sports Office, Miss Alicia Tomo. You know, she's the one that uh, made sure that that uh, inter-island competition happened. And I'm very, very thankful to her. And I hope it's, it's something that uh, remains an every year thing between the two islands competing against one another. That's what the whole thing is about. If we are saying we are trying to promote Virgin Islands football, then definitely St. Croix has to be able to come to the table. Definitely. You're you also run Next Level Athletics. So can you tell me, tell me a little bit about, about what is Next Level Athletics? What do you guys do? Um, Next Level Athletics is myself. I am the president. Derek Heiliger is the vice president. And Kyla Mata is the secretary. And right there, our community is small. So most people already know. I deal with football. Derek deals with basketball. And Mr. Lamata, he deals with baseball. So with that, we just wanted to be able to provide uh, training year-round to the respective student athletes that play our sports and also to be able to showcase them at some point during the year to uh, NCAA colleges. That, that training that you, you just spoke about, um, in the States, uh, high school um, teams – they do their own training off season. Uh, if if a, if an athlete is not part of next level athletics, how how do they get that training, and how important is off off season training in football? Well, the development of the sport or the development in training is probably the most important aspect. You know, um, no athlete wants to come back the same where he was uh, one year and come back the same way the next year. So we're always trying to get better, you know. Um, I was working with uh, uh, several high school athletes this year as far as the training component. And um, for the first time, it was it, the, most of them were struggling with it. But um, we at Next Level, we try to promote the weightlifting aspect of the sport as well as the actual playing of it. So we are, me as a, a division two former athlete, I know how it important it, it is. I myself, I had to do it. So I'm not going to, um, you know, give that student athlete a false showing of what college sports is like. I want to be able to show them that uh, lifting is a very, very important component of it. Um, you just mentioned that you were a former uh, D2 athlete yourself. What type of uh, lessons did you learn 
uh, playing at that level that you're able to teach um, the next generation? We got to be ready. We got to be ready. Um, a lot of times our seniors are not ready, either by them uh, thinking that just because they have the opportunity to go means that their journey is finished. No. When you go up to be part of a team, you actually have to, you know, get playing time, earn your playing time. It's not given like most of our high school athletes here. Um, you have to earn your way. You have to earn your keep. So it's um, definitely based on how hard you work, you know. So our coaches have to um, try to get our athletes to believe in that concept that your, your playing time is earned. It's not because of who you are or what you did your previous year. It's what you can do, what you can show the coaches right now. And we have to be able to compete. We got to be able to compete with our mainland counterparts as well. Um, one thing I think about across the boards in all Virgin Islands sports, is like once you're a starter down here, it's very rarely that you have someone in your position pushing for your spot every day. So that like daily competition, like in the States, if you're wide receiver number one, and you like have two drops and then the wide receiver number two has five catches in a game, you're unseated. But down here, it seems like once you get to that level, there's not that extra push. How do we kind of create that environment down here? Uh, that, well, that has to strictly come from the coaches, you know, the head from the, the, that has to trickle from the head coach down to his coaching staff. That competition is a must. I remember vividly my, my college head football coach, uh, Mel Rose, he used to say competition is a great equalizer. And it's true. So out at Ken, for example, every day we incorporate some kind of competition between our athletes. I think that um, you always having to uh, maintain that edge is a must in, in sports. You know, you can't just think that you're there and there's also another adage that says, um, satisfaction breeds mediocrity. You know, once you start being satisfied with where you are, you're gonna be mediocre. So we are always trying to get better, always trying to compete. I think that's very, very important for today's high school athlete. Travis, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about um, the growth of high school football. You, I, I mean, I know you from when you were coaching CHS, winning championships. You came to the Awaks, you won championships. You went to um, Ken now, you win in championships. Tell me about the growth of, of high school football from when you started to now. Oh, we've come a long, long way. We've come a long, long way. As, even as far as, as, as marking the field, I remember the days when high school coaches used to have to mark the fields. So, um, you know, we can look forward to coming to the games now and not having to be responsible for marking the fields. Um, as far as the quality of play, a lot of coaches are very um, interested in how well they coach, how well they're able to get across the lessons that they want, um, you know. So I think that that has been very, very important in the development um, what's also been very important is the fact that a high school athlete from since 2008 can look forward to being scouted by mainland coaches. And so sometimes that kid now has a whole year to look forward and say to himself, you know, if I work hard enough, I can, I, I too can get a chance to play college football and, and continue my, my education. So that's what we're trying to do with uh, playing the sport, providing opportunities for a lot of these uh, young men. Um, one thing that we've covered in the past before is your summer flag football league. Um, two questions kind of about it. I know you have a bunch of uh, former players come down to play in it and also some high school kids, the elite level of high school kids participate in the summer. What is What do you think it means to those kids to play with guys that did make it to college while they're still in high school? Oh, that's big. That's big. I, you know, from in the 1990s when uh, the first 
men's flag league started, um, I was one of the first that brought high school players into the men's league. And um, it was kind of looked at something novel back then. But to me, I wanted my high school players to be able to play better the following year. So why not try to, um, you know, try to advance their, their challenges? And so that's what I did. Um, that is big, big for the high school players to be able to play with college football players. That's one of the main reasons why I wanted to do it. Um, a lot of times those high school players aren't able to get that kind of hands-on training right there during the summertime. And with the Man League, the Man League provided that. So we're kind of sad. I'm kind of sad that we weren't able to carry on the Men's League this year. COVID kind of shut everything down. But hopefully in the future, we'll be, we'll be able to start it back up. It's like the, when kids aren't in our school, it kind of gives them something to look forward to. Like Saturday night I'm playing and then they have practice during the week to give our kids some structure. What type of, how do you feel sports provides that for youth in the community down here? Well, right now, believe it or not, sports is what's sending a lot of our uh, student athletes to college. You know, we have thousands, thousands of student athletes that play, um, you know, Virgin Islands Department of Education sports every year. Thousands participate. So that child, after going from elementary all the way to high school, definitely now can say, you know, if I do well enough, I can get a scholarship to play the sport that I love because they're seeing the athletes now do it. It's something that's tangible. It's something that's reachable. And I think it's something that our um, 2020 Virgin Islands athlete looks, looks forward to now. It's something that they can, they can grasp now. Uh, you spoke, we spoke a little bit about COVID. Um, do you have any updates on the season? Um, do you think we're going to start, have a season this year because of COVID? I do not. I, I, I really do not think we are going to have a season. It does not look too uh, bright. I look on the mainland and uh, a lot of NFL is shutting down. A lot of college leagues are shutting down. So I don't see Virgin Islands, um, you know, playing right now. I really don't, you know. Um, we, we, have not, we have not had any updates so far as far as uh, what they're going to do with the season. If they did have an update, I missed it. I apologize. Um, one thing that the NCAA is doing, though, is they're considering moving football to the spring as a potential alternative. Maybe get a better grip on this or hopefully a vaccine comes out. But if that, it does, if that starts to be the trend in the States, would you be open to coaching spring, uh, spring football, having a season then? And how would that kind of change recruiting? It wouldn't. It really wouldn't. Um, you know, for me, I, I would coach any time of the year. So I figured as not, much. <laughs> so that def, that definitely would not be a challenge. That would not be a problem. You know, matter of fact, it might just come in perfect timing to bring college coaches down to actually look at a game versus a seven on seven competition. So I welcome it. If that's what they're gonna do, I'm for it. I'm okay with it. How do you how do you um in terms of, of recruitment, what what is um what is your thoughts on what happens to this year's seniors in terms of probably not being able to play their final season and still looking for that scholarship to go to college what what what, what is your, your your plan to deal with that kind of situation well right now that's about the only um you know negative part of the whole thing we really had um a senior that i think was going to blow the top half of everything this year. Um, talking about my senior running back, Terrell Maximin. Um, Terrell has been in the weight room, lifting, getting stronger, getting faster. Um, Edward Waters College already likes him. But all we can do is keep on working with Terrell, 
keep on um, keeping him in the weight room, giving him training as much as we can, and providing video. That's as much as we can do right now until they have a season. And we don't mind. We really don't mind. So if that's what we have to do till fall, I mean, till spring, then fine. We'll do it. Um, you just mentioned video. One of our goals at Mad Hot Media last season was to try and get at least one game from every high school in the territory on film. And we were able to accomplish that. But how does recording the games and having the films for high school players help with the recruiting process? Well, that kind of upped our game by 300%. By people like you, Mad Hot Media, um, Live Wire Sports, you two guys have, like, like, like I said, upped the coaching game, the recruiting game in the Virgin Islands by 300%. Because now athletes can just tell a coach, look at the game. It's been recorded on live wire sports or Mad Hat Media. I'm there. Check me out. And coaches have done it because they've called me. After I've tagged them in one of you guys' videos, they've called me and said, hey, coach, I just looked at the video. I like this guy. That's how Nikoi Archibald was recruited because you guys made a video. Coach looked at it. It was on your platform, and he got signed. So like I said, that has up our game 300%. And I can only encourage you guys, like Wire Sports, Rena Robinson, Shaq Richardson, you, James, continue doing what you're doing. It's helping. It's making a big, big difference. Trust me. Uh, you spoke, uh, you said up in the game. I want to talk about um, expanding the league because we have such um, few games to be able to showcase what these athletes can do. What have you had discussions with the league about maybe adding Totola, Puerto Rico? I don't know, maybe somehow getting a tournament with more teams through more islands. Um, anything like that's been going on? Any discussions like that? Yes, I keep in contact with the Puerto Rican coaches all the time. I was just notified by one of their representatives that their league is also on hold. I speak to coaches who uh, coach in Brazil, in Spain, all over Europe, just trying to see who's open right now. And for the most part, James, most of, most of them are shut right down. Um, as far as locally, one of your past guests just, just got a phone call from Mr. Uh, Mark Daniels, and he's told me that um, he is trying to revive the Arawak football program. So who knows? Um, you and Kyle might be right back in the coaching ranks once again. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Daniels just got all of the Arawak football equipment, and he called me. He said, "Hey, coach, man, I'm going. I'm not going to try this year, but for the next, for the following school year, 21, 22." He wants to revive the Arawak football program. If we have the Arawak football program back in, that's um, you know, that's an extra two games for everybody. Maybe we could recruit you back to be coach. So include. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, James, I'll be honest, man. I'm on my way out, man. I'm on my last, my last leg, believe it or not, man. It's been a great run though, for real. Jarvis, tell me about um, how you're using Zoom during this um, pandemic to keep in contact with your players. Say that one, say that again, James. How are you using the platforms like Zoom to keep in contact with your players during this um, pandemic? We usually meet with our players every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 6 o'clock, a Zoom meeting. Uh, we go over, uh, you know, concepts. We go over team rules. We go over, we send them videos. Right now, we have a push-up challenge going on right now. So, you know, we, we try to keep them as uh, engaged as possible. You back, Kyle? I'm back, I'm back. All Sorry right. about that. I was just uh, saying, like, the private school kids haven't been able to play football the past few years because there's been no Arawaks. Um, 
how beneficial do you think it would be to those children to be back playing tackle football again? It would be it would be it would be a boon for the league, you know, to get the IRAC program back in. Um, the IRACs have been always been a plus when they played. They're a program that they won five straight from 1999 to 2004, and they've always been in the thick of things until um, they were they were stopped from competing back in, I think it was 2013, 2014, somewhere back then. But um, the IRACs have always been a very, very important player in our league. And I, I hope that uh, Mr. Daniel is able to bring them back. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Jarvis? Um, I just hope that um, soon the, the director of the sports department of education sports office is able to have a conversation with us and let us know what's going on with the league, what's going on with dates and whatnot, um, just so we can, you know, pass on the information. Otherwise than that, um, you know, I'm just like everybody else trying to remain uh, safe and trying to spread the word to our players to keep safe as well. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Always love hearing from you. Your insights are very good, very deep, and it uh, gives us an idea of what's really going on in the Virgin Islands High School football landscape. Before you go, Jarvis, I want to I ask you about some national stuff. Tell me, I, I know your team is the Raiders. Tell me about your, your team a little bit, and do you, how do you feel about the move to Las Vegas? Well, being a lifelong Raiders fan, man, I, I'm not with this Las Vegas move, but hey, it is what it is, man. The black and silver will be the black and silver no matter where they play. Um, our, our quarterback situation has, to me, hasn't improved much. We picked up some good wide receivers. I don't know how they'll do um, the first year, um, but I think we'll just. I think we'll be at eight and eight again, a middle of the pack type type team. I don't see any great, you know, uh, changes in their record or their performance for the year. So you don't believe in the, uh, Derek Carr? Is there is Derek Carr or David Carr? What's his name? Derek. Derek I think Carr. Derek is is the uh, David's his brother. Okay, so you don't believe in Derek Carr? No, no. But, but you know, um, but John Gruden does. John Gruden, for some reason, loves Derek Carr. I don't know why, what he sees in him, but he believes in Derek Carr. And, you know, I, I don't see it, but, hey, he's the head coach. He's Chucky. Uh, yeah. One of the pieces that I really liked last year that you, you saw emerge from your guys' offense, that's Jacobs, the running back. What's your thoughts on him? He's, a, he's good. He's good. I, I hope he remains healthy. Um, I hope that uh, maybe they've tweaked their offensive line some. Maybe they've made – I think they did pick up some, um, some pretty good picks on the O-line. So maybe they'll improve. Who knows? But I do not have confidence in Derek Carr. I personally don't have confidence in your coach. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, some of the moves he made last year, I, it had me scratching my head, especially the uh, Amari Cooper move. I mean, how do you feel about the moves he made that was controversial? I don't like any of them. I don't like any of them. You know, um, even before he came, are we talking about Carr or um, Gruden? We're talking about Gruden. I'm talking about the yeah. move he made with, with Amari Cooper, and I think he, he released somebody else who was very good. Yeah, he released the kicker even before he got there. I mean, he was just saying, he didn't, he, you know, he releases the kicker. And the kicker was, like, number one or two in punting and kicking in the league the previous year. He yeah. releases the guy. And then he releases the possibly the number one D-liner in the whole league. He gets rid of him. He gets rid of Cooper. So I don't know what's going on with Chucky, man. All I could say, I hope he takes some more meds and he, uh, he keeps well. All right, that's all the questions I got for the national um, stuff. Uh, Kyle, you have anything else to add? Um, I was going to ask about um, the, the going Henry Ruggs, wide receiver, for, for, with the first pick. That's, 
that's something else that's crazy too because Ruggs was was not Alabama's number one pick. I mean, number one receiver, Judy was. So yeah. I don't know why you would go and pick the number two or three receiver on a team when one is available. I, I have no clue, but hey, Chucky is Chucky. Hey, speed kills. He was the fastest speed one kills. in the draft. Speed kills. Speed kills, yeah. Yeah, once again, thank you for your time, man. Um, just reminding the viewers, Stick and stay with Mad Hot Media for the latest and greatest of Virgin Island sports. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, uh, thanks for doing what you do. Continue to do it. And um, bless everybody today. Keep well. Yes, sir. All right, guys. All right.